Another book in Brigmore Manor. The Shadow on Bitterleaf. I guess this is a kind of short one. Excerpt from a longer work of fiction. Finding my way by the feeble light of the dying fire, I saw her working. A large needle moved in her hand, following precise esoteric patterns, knots and loops of seamstress craft from ancient days. Beneath her needle, his body clinched and shuddered, shaking the wooden table. A morbid fascination pushed me closer until she turned her blank face toward me, resting the needle in his flesh. With a refined tone, she addressed me. So you are the lover, I presume. You too have been unfaithful, and it is now your turn to be mended. Wow. Another while we're at it. Excerpt from a theater play. Young Lady Amelia in the back garden. Duchess, I do not know of the world beyond these garden walls. But do not mistake my lack of experience for fear, or for an absence of desire. If I've avoided you, it is because of the warming your name I'm sorry, the warning your name carries. Duchess Kali, bending a rose to her face, inhaling the scent. And what warning is that, my dear Amelia? Young lady Amelia, turning her back on the Duchess, I believe you know my meaning. Your father's tales are still the subject of parlor gossip. Duchess Kali stepping up close. And do those stories excite you? Tell me, girl, I am a friend. Young Lady Amelia, hesitating. Duchess Kali, I... Yes, I confess they do. In my youth, I hid a copy of the tales of Prince Kalasar. I read them late into the night. Duchess Kali, speaking into her ear, as did I. Young Lady Amelia, leaning back into her embrace. But he was your father. Duchess Kali, stroking her neck. They're just stories, Amelia. Fire for the imagination. Young Lady Amelia, breathing deeply. Duchess, will you teach me to kiss? Duchess Callie, cooing softly. I will, but have you never kissed another? A beery, a rose gardener, emerging from the hedges, stammering. My ladies, I swear to you, I did not intend to spy. Forgive me, but I was pruning the hedge and could not find a way to interrupt. Duchess Callie, extending a hand. We forgive you, but as punishment, I command you to stay and to come closer. Young Lady Amelia, shocked, brows furrowed in irritation, but he's a servant, Duchess. Duchess Callie, pulling at each of them, drawing them close to her, and serve us he will, young Amelia. Wow, it's like a cheesy pool man porno. More books from Brigmore Manor. Warning on corrupted charms, excerpt from an overseer's report on black market occult artifacts. Vice Overseer Milios. While traveling in Circonos, which is of course within your purview, I came across a matter that demands your attention. My brothers and I were using the overland route from Colero to Karnaka, escorting two of our sisters from the oracular order as you requested months ago. My apologies for the delay. High Overseer Campbell is a busy man, as I'm sure you understand, and sometimes such deployments fall to the wayside as his mind is devoted to some immediate concern of higher import in our struggle against the outsider. Halfway to Karnaka, our caravan stopped in a lakeside town where we learned that a man had been recently murdered. Initially, this was no cause for our involvement until we heard about some of the things found in his keeping. Red wax candles that we suspect were mixed with ox blood, clippings of hair, and a painting that hung over his kitchen table depicting a small girl child carrying two dried leaves. I need not tell a man of your wisdom that these things were of concern, but other clues confiscated at the site were far more serious. The victim's finely appointed rooms were located on the top floor, looking down over the lake. He was a merchant of some means, and from what we found, it's clear that he was trafficking in heresy, attempting to buy an occult charm constructed of whalebone. What makes this case different is that the man was not attempting to purchase some superstitious sailor's carving from bygone days. Here we have a situation in which a private citizen and a functioning member of society actually commissioned the creation of a new artifact aimed at a specific purpose. Uh, you know, I think that this relates to the journal that I read about the guy who uh, ended up seeing his, uh, uh, his one heart's true desire ravaged by a lot of other men, everybody he hates, basically. Uh, I think that's probably referring to him. 
Those offering this service, from what we can tell, were attempting to craft a new charm from shards of older whalebone talismans. Vice Overseer, we believe that this new artifact was damaged in some way, creating the rift between buyer and seller, which resulted in murder. From what we've gathered, the item possessed some occult power. It also seemed to come at a cost, however, afflicting the bearer in several unwanted ways as well. Whether the individual or cult responsible for the creation of the corrupted bone charm made it that way deliberately, or whether their capabilities proved somehow inferior, is not something we know at this time. However, this occurrence matches other such stories from across the aisles, as a coddled generation has grown more accepting of heresy, even taking delight in the tales of witchcraft found in lurid adventure stories. This is the result. Now even those with no real connection to the void are attempting to devise their own disgusting rituals and talismans. Such corrupted bone charms and fractured runes could be even more dangerous than the original artifacts, as impossible as that may seem. As I must now journey to Dunwall to take up my next assignment, I leave any further investigation in your capable hands. However, I've left copies of this letter with several outposts along the way to Karnaka, and I've asked that any loyal to the Abbey who come across these words, if they have the time and means, copy them for our brethren and for those over whom they watch. The merchant is dead, but those who crafted this corrupted charm still walk the land. Roving feet? Our worries are not overzealous imaginings, as some would claim but represent a very real danger. As you will agree, these matters should be of grave concern to any who wish to keep our lands free from the curses of the void. Overseer Angus Duncan, Freyport Outpost, Morley. Interesting. So the overseers are wise to the shenanigans of the uh, corrupted bone charms. More books. More books. In the Brigmore Manor. The Blight of the Cobblestone, excerpt from street pamphlet drafted by anonymous intellectuals. Action is necessary if the Empire is to stand against the juggernaut of what is commonly called industrial progress. The momentum of this hungry beast requires equal vigor simply to halt its destructive advance. No action against the industrialization of our nation's states can be deemed too extreme when we understand what is at stake. The advancement of industry infects every aspect of our lives, and hazardous conditions assault the citizens of Dunwall daily. Workers are treated as disposable cogs in the machine, sacrificing their lives in the name of faster construction, mass assembly, and greater profits. Should those of us in opposition to these trends not sacrifice themselves in the fight against our unfeeling oppressor? Will we be satisfied when our children ask what a pasture is, and the best we can do is to point to a cobblestone street, black with the filth of mechanical production. Will we struggle in the coming years to recall a time when we actually made our pies by hand, or baked bread in the ways of our grandmothers? What is at stake today are our very cultures, from the cold north of Tivia, down through Morley and Gristol, all the way to the warm south of Circonos. All men and women with a love for our ways must stand against these changes. That actually sounds shockingly like the Industrial Revolution that happened in America. Uh, work conditions were poor, suffice to say. If you think you're in bad shape today, working a factory job, uh, you don't have anything on people 80 and 100 years ago. Painting ritual. The painting of the possession target must be positioned above the altar. After preparing the ritual, the performer must lay on the altar. If the ritual has been prepared correctly, the performer will then enter into the body of the subject of the painting. Warning, the subject of the painting must be the possession target. Any other painting may trap the performer of the ritual. Interesting. My god, the books! The books are everywhere! A second solution! Excerpt from a series of newspaper articles from prominent natural philosophers by Piero Joplin. Uh, Piero Joplin was the guy that helped Corvo in your, like, hometown area, or whatever you want to call it, your, your HQ uh, in, in Vanilla Dishonored. It is through no fault of my own that the average citizen has expressed a preference for Sokolov's elixir over my own formula, sold as Piero's Remedy, a name I did not choose if you must know the truth. The public has spoken its usual message of idiocy spending their coin as a means of selecting Sokolov's formula over mine, which I believe to be equal, if not superior. 
Much has been made over the popularity of these concoctions as a means of resisting this remarkable new plague. I say remarkable because this strain works with an efficiency we have not seen in the history of the Empire. This plague, now making its way through the city of Dunwall, is unrivaled in its effectiveness. I have studied it within the blood of those so afflicted, and it is nearly perfect. Elegant, in fact. And while it is true that Piero's remedy and Sokolov's elixir are known to protect the body against the plague equally, my own has properties not fully understood which relate to the mind itself and the spirit. And it's in this way that my formula wins out. Here is where one should pay attention to this contest. For you see, Sokolov's elixir, with its emphasis on the brute animal body, is a crass goo better suited for livestock. The subtle and secret variants in the key ingredients making up Piero's remedy ensure that it works on the higher functions that separate humankind from the mindless brute-jawed hagfish swimming in the Rinhaven River, written uh, by a true prideful pony. Um, I don't know. Sounds like Piero's very bitter. Very bitter. With the marathon book reading... Delilah's journal. Now that the painting is finished, I will sit in young lady Emily's skin and wear her face like a mummer's mask. Havelock and his lick spittles will put the child on the throne, but it is me they will be crowning. Delilah, the kitchen girl from Dunwall Tower. They called me Sokolov's apprentice, but whose paintings reached through to the spirit? Mine. They will never know their blunder, but I will be sure to whisper it into their ears at their executions. My followers will bear the lantern to the gallery in order to open the way to the void. There, I will use the painting to complete the ritual. My walk into Emily's flesh must be undisturbed. The ritual has other uses which I will explore over time. Any image made by my hand could serve as the focal point for the spell. I imagine one of my enemies as a still life imprisoned in a bowl of fruit without amusement. So Delilah wants to use Emily to become Empress? Yes, that sounds likely, Dowd, but hold off until we get back to the main video. My god, I nearly missed them in the studio. Uh, more books. I think both of these are from Vanilla Dishonor, but I didn't read many of those, so how about we read some more books? This book video is going to be almost as long as one of my playthrough parts. The Fugue Feast, excerpt from a book on the celebrations and holidays. At the end of every year, after the last day of the month of songs, we begin the Fugue Feast. The new year is not started unless the time that follows is outside the calendar. A period of celebration and feasting begins, during which the people abandon the very practices that keep them whole and healthy over the year. Many leave their homes euphoric with spirits or potent herbs. Some paint their faces or wear masks to conceal themselves as they pursue their passions without reservation. When the right cosmological signs are observed and it is time for the calendar to begin anew, the sitting high overseer calls for the hymn of atonement and the fugue feast ends. Families return to their homes, wives to their husbands, enemies put down their weapons and fires are extinguished. No complaint is given for those who have wronged others, deviated from ancient codes or discarded oaths, for this time during the astrological alignment does not exist and is not recorded. The following day starts the new year, marked on the first day of the month of Earth, as it has always been. Uh, that seems very impossible for any civilized anything. Uh, a period of no law. It just doesn't work like that. The Howl from Beyond. Excerpt from a work of fiction by P.J. Stokeworth. Worthy of that Stoke and as Gregory... And Alia, 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 crouched in the dark of the upper hall, they could hear the thing drawing close. It had followed them from the forest, through the garden, and into the house. Now as they leaned against the wall, exhausted and terrified, they could hear it coming up the stair. Moving slowly, it scraped along. Exposed bone dragging across wooden carpet, a ragged panting foretold its passage as dead air was pushed through a throat eaten away with rot. Reaching a grim conclusion, Alia swallowed. Her face went slack and she gave Gregory a final glance before plunging through the window glass into the moonlight and night air. 
At the sound of her delicate body smashing against the cobblestone below, Gregory let out a keening moan, and as he did, his voice was matched by an unearthly howl from the stairwell, and the rapid scratching of clawed feet rushing up toward him. Clawed feet? It does say a work of fiction, so I guess that's not necessarily describing anything that's actually in the game, uh, but rather just something else. Well, there you have it. More books down the putty! Thank you for watching, Tube Dwellers. Stay tuned for more.